It's Crash Connell. Thanks for all the positive feedback uh, from yesterday. We played the <clears throat> the Understanding the Times episode from uh, over the weekend about uh, what happens after the rapture. A lot of good positive feedback about that yesterday for our live listeners. It is a fresh new podcast today, Thursday, January 11, 2024. Good morning, Mary. Good morning. Uh, you is. try to keep this professional today because no fangirling. <laughs> Do my best, Crash, <laughs> because yeah. we are welcoming back T. A. McMahon right. of the Brian Call this morning, and he has always had his finger on the pulse of the state of the church, and he, uh, you know, just boldly declares and calls out falsehood. Um, and some people may want to hear that, and sometimes some people don't want to hear that. But praise the Lord, our job is to be faithful, and I know all those at the Brian Call have been faithful. Uh, scripture this morning, Second Thessalonians 2.11, and I think it's appropriate for what we're going to be talking about today. And it says, for the, oh, I've actually got more than 2.11 here, now that I look at it myself. So I have uh, 7 to 12, it's my own typo. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will, lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this reason God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie, that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. <clears throat> Very sobering verses there. Oh, let's pray. Lord, we come before you just in need of your grace and mercy today, and we are so grateful, eternally grateful, uh, that you provided a way for us to spend eternity with you. Thank you, Jesus, for your sacrifice. So we praise and worship you today. We give our lives to you afresh and anew. We lift up T.A. McMahon and Berean Call and everyone who works there, the ministry uh, in general and as a whole. Thank you for their faithfulness, the gifts that you've given them and the impact on the body of Christ over the years. Pray you protect them and bless them, um, provide for all needs, um, just good health, encouragement, refreshment in your word, Lord. Thank you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, T.A. McMahon, again, is my guest, president and executive director of the Berean Call Ministry, editor-in-chief and contributing writer for the Berean Call Newsletter. He is a co-author of The Seduction of Christianity, uh, the Sorcerer's New Apprentice, Understand the Times, and author of Showtime for the Sheep and Temporal Delusion. Holder of a master's degree in communications, he has researched and written numerous documentaries, scripted, scripted several feature films. His writing and producing for Christian videos includes The Cult Explosion, there's a classic, The God Makers, another classic, The New Age, Pathway to Paradise, The Evolution Conspiracy, A Woman Rides the Beast, Israel, Islam, and Armageddon, and Psychology in the Church, uh, such a wonderful body of work that has blessed the church over the years. TheBereanCall.org. Make sure you put the the there. Uh, Tom, I've been reading the newsletter since the late 80s. Not just the main articles, which were always very meaty, but the Q&A. All right. I learned more from people's questions and well-reasoned <laughs> responses, I think. You know, as a young believer, I'd read the question and go, how are they going to respond to that? And I, I just was blown away as a new believer. Welcome back to Stand Up for the Truth, Tom. Thank you, and it's always a privilege. And, uh, you know, I just want to mention something. As you were praying and went through those verses, um, yeah, we try to exhort and encourage discernment. But what we really want, what you guys want, we want people to have a love for the truth. Mm -hmm. You know, that mm -hmm. verse just stands out. It's a scary verse and because it says that those who have not a love for the truth, God will send strong delusion. Mm -hmm. In other words, they've rejected what the Word of God clearly says. They've rejected that. And what have you got? Well, you don't have anything but Satan's lies. Yeah. And, uh, and as we're going to talk about today, he's got different ways of uh, revising, reissuing um, apologetics. It's not like it used to be when, when you got when you got saved, yeah. when I got saved, mm -hmm. it's not. And we'll talk about that. Yeah, I remember reading Seduction of Christianity. It's the first <laughs> book I picked up a few years after I got saved. I just read the scriptures first, and then I picked that up. And what, what you guys were talking about, I thought, what do you mean another Jesus? What do you mean there's something they, they don't, you know, they're off here and there on these other things? And I was amazed because I was still in that, that 
you know, in love with Jesus faith, that brand new uh, believer phase. And I, I, I blew my mind that people were deserting a sound doctrine for something else besides Jesus. And, and so that was a real wake up call for me. And I've been, like I said, I've been reading the newsletter since the late 80s. How can people get the newsletter? You still send it out? Absolutely. Uh, well, you know, you can get it online. You go to thebringcall.org and, you know, it's right there for you. <clears throat> some, excuse me, <clears throat> some uh, people, nevertheless, they like to have something in their hands, mm-hmm. you know, hard copy. And we, we make it available. Yeah, great. Great. I really encourage people to get the newsletter and, and read it through and through, and, and I'm sure that uh, you will learn a lot. Uh, this article that you have here, T.A., The Flight from Reason, now that's a, a Brian Call newsletter um, from s- uh, several months ago, and you say a few things here that really caught my, my eye. Uh, one of them is, our day is well into a flight from reason. When one rejects or slips away from God's word, he is left with his own irrational ways and means to solve a problem, and Proverbs fourteen twelve really comes alongside that. There's a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. The other quote you have here is, knowing what you believe but not why is the heart of fleeing from reason. Tom, open us up today about what it is about uh, uh, that, what we should uh, know the what, and we often don't know the why. Tell us a little bit more about that. Right. Well, <clears throat> I want to talk just briefly, just go back over okay. Proverbs fourteen twelve. And then um, it's also basically repeated in Proverbs sixteen twenty five. You know, mm-hmm. when the Bible says verily, <laughs> the Lord wants us to pay attention, yes, right? You bet. But when He says verily, verily, <laughs> we better <laughs> we, we better pay attention. Mm-hmm. So here we have Proverbs repeating the same thing. And when it says, "But the end thereof are the ways of death," it's not necessarily talking about physical death. It's talking, death always involves separation. Mm -hmm. And if it's not physical death, and in this particular case, it has to do with separation from the truth. And that's what we're going to be, we're going to be talking about. Sorry, I get a little frog here, but I'll try and get rid of it. And we have that too for some reason. Crash and I both have that this morning too. Okay. Well, in any case, the, the point is, it's a separation. And... You know, one of the things about the adversary, I mean, he's the guy behind all of this. Uh, he, he is, his MO, his program, is to separate a believer from the truth, or if somebody hasn't been saved, to keep them away from the truth, the way, the truth, and the life, which is Jesus himself. So um, the, in, in terms of <clears throat> what's going on with this, boy, oh, boy, just a second, let me try and what this down a little bit. You're listening to Stand Up for the Truth. We're talking to T.A. McMahon today from the Berean Call, and we just got started, and we both seem to have a little frog in our throat, so bear with us today. Yeah, <clears throat> right. So <clears throat> the, the, the point of all this is that that's what we're seeing. The adversary's program has been from the beginning. Mm-hmm. It has been to keep believers, either distort the truth of something they believe but it's not consistent with the Word of God, mm-hmm. or it has to do with his own ideas and so on. Now, remember, the adversary, <clears throat> he's the father of lies. So whatever you're going to get from him, his side is going to be a lie. It, it will not be anything close to the truth except when he can deceive mm-hmm. uh, and, and really deal with issues that people don't quite understand, but they're not willing to, as the Scripture says, the time will come when they will not when they will not want, when they we will not endure sound doctrine. And um, that that's his game plan. Mm-hmm. And we're going to get into some of the particulars, which I think people can relate to. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. There's a great article out there in the Christian Courier. Um, I don't agree with all of it, but it, it's entitled, Does God Send Delusions? Can a Person Harden Himself Beyond Hope? And the verse that's quoted here is Ephesians four eighteen and 19. And Paul says, being darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the hardening of their heart, who being past feeling, gave themselves up to lasciviousness to work all uncleanness and greediness. Uh, I think that's kind of significant, um, you know, that you aren't even concerned about the implications of what you're doing anymore, you know, becoming callous or cauterized, your conscience is cauterized. That's a scary place to be. Yeah, and the one, <clears throat> the one way that the adversary is um, imposing his seduction, you know, on 
whether it be believers or people who haven't come to Christ and so on, the way he's going to do that is move away from the objective truth. Because mm-hmm. that's, listen, we either have the objective truth of God's word or we've got what men make up. That's mm-hmm. why, you know, you started off with and we, we quoted Proverbs. There's a way that seems right, mm-hmm. but it seems right, but it's a way of separation from the truth. And that's the battle that's going on. And the easiest way, well, I won't say it's the easiest way, but the most effective way that we're seeing now is that he's gotten, the adversary has gotten away from objective truth. Remember, they will not endure sound doctrine. Mm-hmm. To what? To feelings, to emotions, to a very subjective realm. Mm-hmm. And uh, as this takes over with people, because, you know, how do you argue with somebody? How do you make up a, a, a program of apologetics? that's based on feelings you know right your feelings are your feelings right. you know right. right or wrong the, the point is that you don't you can't argue with regard to how somebody feels that's right. hey that's the way they feel so it's been very effective and you know uh mayor you, you sent me a, a list of things that we could just work down through to give people a, an example of what we're talking about what he's doing and and what they're observing yes but maybe not really taking to heart. Yes, and I think we can go through that list. I think that would be great. I was thinking um, yesterday and today about a verse in Judges 21 to 25. They had no king. Uh, It says here, uh, the last line of the book of Judges sums up the whole mess that Samson and the people of Israel were in. In those days, there was no king, and everyone did what was right in his own eyes. And I thought that was interesting because uh, the king, of course, in our lives is Jesus, if you don't have that authority of the King of Jesus, uh, his kingship and his authority over your life and the scriptures, people will do what's right in their own eyes. And we were looking at, uh, um, I mean, life is difficult now. People are going through a lot of difficulties, but because they're not equipped and the churches no longer teach God's word with authority, um, they're doing what's right in their own eyes. I really believe that that is true. We have emotion, the emotion-driven church, which I think is, is really the basis of a lot of this mischief. Um, but ways that we look to anything uh, but the revealed Word of God. Uh, TA3, emergent church and such, we've got mysticism. That's based on feeling. Psychology is based on feeling. Uh, Gender dysphoria, um, and we can go back and talk about these. Um, The name it and claim it, you know, materialism, God has to do what I want. It's all about me. Uh, People reason within themselves. Uh, I can't believe in a God who would send people to hell or allow evil and sickness. Where was God when this happened? Um, T.A., let's go back and talk about some of these um, that, like I said, are all based on how we feel. And and that's why they get off. Because clearly, uh, name it and claim it, uh, Copeland's been doing uh, his thing for so long, and people still get sucked into that. So uh, what are your thoughts on on all of these things and and how they manipulate people away from God? Well, because they're telling them, you know, as it says in 2 Timothy, uh, I think it's chapter 4, they're listening to those who would tickle their ears. They're they're moving away from things that bring conviction. You know, who wants conviction? You know, Mm -hmm. you mentioned earlier, you know, I, I had the great privilege of working with Dave on the seduction of Christianity. (laughs) The reason we wrote that book was because many in the church were, or leaders in the church, were buying into some things. Hey, give me chapter and verse. They couldn't do it Mm -hmm. because it wasn't there. Mm -hmm. So consequently, when you correct something, and you guys have the same problem with regard to the audience that you have. Hopefully, people are understanding what you're saying, yeah. and they're being Bereans. They're searching the scriptures to see if what you're saying are true. Mm-hmm. But there are people who don't want that because, again, it either brings conviction of sin, it brings uh, erroneous ideas, uh, you know, that are out there. You know, one of the things that really underlines, underscores all of this is what do most Christians claim to believe? And I say most, I mean, I probably have to throw that word out because the time will come when they will not. So many are not not really referring to chapter and verse or to recognizing mm-hmm. that, no, this is not of the Scriptures. Okay, so what are we talking about here? Oh, most Christians believe in the inerrancy of God's Word, right? They They claim to believe in the authority of God's Word, and then they also claim to believe in the sufficiency of God's Word. Well, let's back, let's back through that. Um, one of the sad things among, you know, guys who may be rock solid in so many aspects of the of the scriptures, they really 
when push comes to shove, they do not believe in the sufficiency of God's word. Well, how can I say that? Well, just check them out because mm-hmm. they they refer people out mm-hmm. to whether it be psychological getting their problem solved or something like that. No, I can't do this because I don't have a degree in psychology and right. so on and so forth. So they basically are bailing out on the sufficiency of God's word. Does the word of God talk about its sufficiency? Yes. Yeah. All things have been given. Okay. Yeah. All things, yeah. you know, the, the sufficiency of God's word is laid out very clearly. Yeah. And if it's not, then what do we do? Well, let's go back to the other point. If it's not sufficient, and guess what? It's not our authority. Right. So basically, they're undermining what the Bible says clearly and puts out for the body of Christ. Mm-hmm. So if the sufficiency is not there, then we've got to look to other people for our authority, right? Or other systems or methodologies mm-hmm. or whatever it might be. And again, it covers the stuff that you, you referred to, Mary. You know, whether it be the word faith teaching or something like that. Hey, I mean, how far can that go? Well, you just have to check it out. They, they want to take over the world. They they believe that God is, that Jesus is being held in the heavenlies until right. we transform this weed, but that is a day, transform this world into uh, solving all of its problems, and then Jesus can return. Mm-hmm. Give me chapter and verse for that. No, right. that's that's a theology that's antichrist to right. the max. And so many people. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. Sure, go ahead. So many people are drawn into Dominion Theology these days, and that was one that I forgot. I left off my list. Uh, Again, mysticism, uh, the emergent church, uh, mysticism and contemplation and that sort of thing, and psychology. And, and, Tom, people come into churches all the time, and they are looking for counseling on something. And you say that pastors are guilty of often farming it out to a Christian counseling service. And yet— that sounds good. It appeals to the emotion, but do people really know what that means? Do they understand um, when actually it should simply be from the Word? And I've heard you say this many times. We've, we've been together in Appleton at conferences. You always say to people, well, what does God's Word say about your problem? I mean, isn't that, shouldn't that be the normal starting point? Instead, that seems to be the last place where people go. Yeah, yeah. Well, come on. Why go to our Creator? Like he knows him. <laughs> Right. No, it's the theater of the absurd, mm-hmm. and it's moving. Well, look, you know, without you know jumping off into other stuff, but we'll, we'll grab something else along this line. But the whole transgender thing—I mean, it's yeah. it's irrational, it's ridiculous. There's no basis for it, and so on. But wait a minute, how does it make you feel? Mm-hmm. Well, you know, we, certainly we, you know, we're, we're more concerned about people's feelings regardless of whether it's the truth or not, and it's not. You know, it's it's so anti-rationale, anti, or not not rationale, but anti, anti-reason. anti Right. There's no basis for it, but it doesn't make any difference. If it makes you feel good, if, if it moves you down a line a little bit, even though it's going to turn to what? Well, we just read it in Proverbs. It turns to irrationality, to destruction, mm-hmm. to all of those things. In other words, it's not going to fix your problem. And that's what everybody wants. They're trying to find somebody or some system or some methodology that will fix their problem. Right. No. Right. And to prove how far Jesus. how far we you know. how far we've gone in this is if you don't embrace that, you're you're the guilty one. You need to be uh, inclusive and embracing all of these things because, like you said earlier, you can't argue with how someone feels. Well. You know, talk about a guilt trip. The whole political correctness and, and all that has just completely infiltrated the church, inclusivity, uh, all the, the aspects of liberal theology that you'd expect to be only in politics has certainly come into the church in spades. Yeah. Well, I mean, we see it <clears throat> We see it in the world. We see it overwhelmingly affecting, you know, legislatures and, and, and politics and all of that stuff. Mm-hmm. Well— we're not to go by that. Yeah. You know, we, we hold up, we're Bereans. We hold everything up to the Word of God. Is it truth? Right. And again, you know, not to make this too complicated because, you know, one of the, one of the definitions of mysticism is confusion. Hmm. And that's one of the adversaries' programs. So let's get it out there. Let's, let's keep them, you know, outthinking themselves yeah. or coming up with subjective solutions that have no basis in reality. I've never worked. But nevertheless, right. you know, there's pleasure in sin for a season. If I'm feeling, oh, well, wait a minute, that, that's okay. That made me feel better. For how long? Right. Uh, right. And, and to what end? Right. Well, we read it. Destruction. Yeah, destruction. 
And, you know, I, I think I said earlier, I think that uh, the drift to the emotional-based church really uh, is a foundational problem here. A lot of the other things are symptoms of, uh, but this is how we may have gotten here. And I, I want to give a little disclaimer here. Truth and emotions, God give us, um, gives us emotions. He has given them to us. They are designed to go right. together. You know, an emotional response to something that is true there's nothing wrong with that. It causes us to feel appropriately about the truth of the scriptures. But there are times that our emotions can betray us, point us uh, in the wrong direction. And within church now, it reduces our faith to the notion that what we feel is more important than what we believe. So there's an emotional response to um, the gospel message uh, that can certainly accompany truth. But there's also emotional reactions. And I, my fear is that where the church, that's where the church has gone, to cultivate emotional reactions. And I'm just going to explain what I mean by that. Uh, an emotional-driven church, they, they, they craft songs, uh, not even true worship, but, but really narcissism disguised as worship because the songs are all about us, I, me, my. And then they craft moments to manipulate emotional reactions, which is very, very common. And so people have come to equate God showing up. Oh, God showed up today at a service, you know, with with a depth of emotional response that is supposed to prove that God showed up. The Spirit was there. It's very subjective. People say, well, Holy Spirit's not in this church. Well, how do you know that? And so, Tom, I think this has been really, really dangerous. Um, And churches have more emotion-driven Sunday gatherings. Tell us what you think about that. Yeah. But Mayor, let me let me throw in a little history here. You okay. know, once I've been writing about this easily for the specific thing with regard to the subjective aspects of of what's going on today. And but the Lord made me reminded me, you know, I have five kids, and when we were visiting a church, I would want to see what the kids program was going to be about. And in doing that, I wanted to know what they were going to be taught and and how they were going to be brought along. And so as I was listening to, it was almost the end of a, uh, of a session, and as I was listening to it, the, the, the pastor, young youth pastor, he was pointing out some things that the Word of God said about, you know, how you go about under, know, knowing the Word of God and, and where you are and how you need to study the Bible and so on. And, and then he went around and asked all the kids what they thought. Well, he got to one kid, and he said, well, <clears throat> um, I, you know, I hear what you're saying, Pastor, but, uh, but I just, that's not what I go for. Here's what I go for. And he laid out his own theology. <laughs> and, of course, it was the end of the, uh, you know, it was re- the end of the session, and there was no time to really correct him. But that was the mentality that was out there. You see, again, there's a way that seems right not only to men, but there's a way that seems right to anybody who has their, bring, wants to enforce their own ideas or impose their own ideas mm-hmm. on Scripture. Mm-hmm. Now, here's what, uh, in writing about some of this later, and let's see, I'm sure you've got some oldies but goodies who tune into your program, um, what the Lord reminded me of, at that particular time, uh, youth pastors were under the gun. Why? Well, because they needed to, their pastors were telling them, hey, we, get, we need to get more kids in here. We need to bring them in. What did they turn to? It's called entertainment. Mm-hmm. Let's go back to the, you know, to the 80s, to, to the 90s, and so on. That has had incredible um, damage, done incredible damage to the church, even to the point where the mentality is, let's inter- entertain them. Now, we're going to talk later, probably maybe, you know, toward the end of the program, how that is still being used and effective, mm-hmm. adversely effective mm-hmm. for the body of Christ. Um yes. It's like, hey, well, we'll, we'll ever bring him in. Let's let's get that out there. Let's keep him here through this and so on. No matter what it has to say or do about the Word of God, the mm-hmm. truth, mm-hmm. and that's where the battle is coming to, mm-hmm. and is right now. Mm-hmm. And some of the examples that you've mentioned, Mayor, um, it's clear. This isn't some secret thing that the uh, that all of a sudden the adversary has snuck in. No, this is so overt. It's it's billboard, you know. Yeah. It's like, why would anybody, you know, for example, it, you know, we just kind of pointed out the whole issue that's going on, the transgender thing. It's irrational. It's illogical. I mean, there's just no way, there's no basis for it except for what? 
mm-hmm. well, Tom, you know, I hear what you said. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, you use scripture and so on. But I'm sorry, Tom. I just don't feel that way. I don't feel that way. Boom. <laughs> and you can't even, you, you can't, you know, you're, you're laughing and I'm laughing, but we're crying on the inside, right. aren't we, Mary? Right. Because, because it's tragic. It is tragic. It's absolutely tragic. It is, and we've been around long enough to see this slow collapse, and a lot of this started with Rick Warren's purpose-driven life. Find your purpose. It's all about you, and the book is just full of psychology. It really is, from, from beginning to end. And and then we had the seeker churches, you know, the, the mega churches, the the Hybels and, and Rick Warren's church, you know, the church exists to meet my needs. This is what I need in a church. I have to like the music. I need relationships. Um, the preacher's job is to feed me, but not, my life isn't changing. Well, first of all, worship isn't singing. It's actually surrender. Make some relationships. Um, you know, the rest of the week, when you're not there for that hour, study the scriptures yourself. This is on you. I don't like this or that. Well, try serving instead of observing. Get your hands dirty. Be a servant. But people, Tom, people don't think that way. They, they, they start out by saying, this is what I want. This is what you need to do for me. And for some reason, the rest of the equation is completely lost on them on what they should be doing. So all that to say, I think things, um, when I first got saved in the 80s, it, it's Dave Hunt, I'm, Dave Hunt was in the bookstores. What can I say? And there were only a few translations. Now there, we have the message, Tom. We have 100 different versions of Scripture designed for anyone out there who feels they need their own version. So this has been going on a while. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Well, <clears throat> Let me go back to, uh, uh, let, let's get a little tougher here. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we got two minutes before the break, so we might, have to, we might have to come back to that, but go ahead. Yeah, okay. Well, that'll maybe uh, have uh, something for people to look forward to, or not. <laughs> okay. But honestly, it's critical. It's absolutely important. So well, when we come back, get ready. Put your seatbelts on, yeah. folks. <laughs> Well, we have another we have another minute yet, a minute and a half, oh, if you do? want to tease that. Well, okay, let's go back to the uh, to the eighties. What was the overwhelming movement in the church? It was the whole self love, self esteem, yeah. all yeah. those issues. And I guess where the leaders in the church who promoted this thing, guess where they got it? They got it from godless psychiatrists, godless you know people like Nietzsche and so on. What was the issue? that Nietzsche poured, poured out and the church bought hook, line, and sinker. The, the issue was, the problem, this is Nietzsche, the problem with you Christians is you don't love yourself enough. Mm. And, and I could give you a list of, of uh, uh, godless psychiatrists who promoted the same idea and the church ate it up. Mm. Well, you know, and if you, if you think I'm making this up, folks, do a little checking in the history of the, of the church, you know, whether it be Dobson, whether it be Christian psychologists, all of these individuals um, bought into the lie that they don't mm-hmm. love themselves enough. Mm-hmm. Give me chapter and verse for that. Right. No, you can't find it. Yes, yes. And it was Dave who I remember saying, the Bible says we already love ourselves enough. We, that is the number one underlying issue here. And it's easily answered just knowing that we already love ourselves so that we should love our neighbors as we already love ourselves. And I'll never forget him saying that. And I'll never forget the self-esteem movement when I was raising my daughter. Um, we are talking to T.A. McMahon of The Berean Call, thebereancall.org. And we're talking about all the various ways the church has slipped into an emotional state where they can no longer reason with God. And we're talking about also the flight from reason, which is a, a great episode, issue of the newsletter from the Brian Call, and we're going to be back in a couple of minutes, and we are going to talk about some of the other areas where emotion has entered the church, and people are leaving their Bibles at home to collect dust, and then we're going to talk about a film that came out uh, in uh, November that will uh, probably blow your mind, so we'll be right back. Feedback, questions, and topic suggestions are always appreciated. Email us at comments at standupforthetruth.com. Welcome back to Stand Up For The Truth for this uh, somewhat snowy Thursday, at least it here is in Wisconsin. We are speaking to T.A. McMahon of the Berean Call, and we're talking about the ways that churches and believers have become much more emotion-driven, and they're no longer able to to give a reason for what they believe, the what, the why they believe it. Um, The church is more centered on people than on God. Um, And some of the uh, just examples of that would be 
uh, dominion theology, how people feel about prophecy, mysticism, psychology, uh, gender surrender movement, name it and claim it, the NAR, oh my goodness, that is just completely uh, based on emotions and um, the hyper-charismatic movement, social justice, inclusivity, um, putting guilt on people for not including everyone in under the big tent of quote-unquote Christianity. So Tom, you wanted to add something onto that about psychology and working with the Bobgins, Martin and Deidre Bobgin, for so long on emotions. What was that yeah. that you wanted to share? Well, be, be, before before I, I, I go there, um, you know, uh, and, and uh, the, the last half hour we talked about a, an epiphany that I had <laughs> that God gave me with regard to entertainment. Um, you know, we were talking about youth groups and so on, and the pressure was on youth pastors to, come on, get the kids in, bring them in, you know, whatever it takes. You know, we need the kids in here and so on. Mm-hmm. A great idea, but uh, but not a methodology that, uh, that, well, it's been destructive, bottom line. And w- what we're seeing today is that hasn't gone away. You know, the whole idea is get them in, but wait a minute. The, the Scripture says the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. And I gave a little kind of a part of a story about a young man who liked his way better than, than the Word of God's way. He said, no, this is what we need to do, and so on. Now, there wasn't time to correct him, but I'm sure the youth pastor that was there, you know, the, maybe the next session, hopefully the next session I didn't attend, but, uh, but he got to that issue. So what does entertainment do? It makes you feel good. It mm-hmm. makes you, you're going to have things out there that, um, you know, Oh, but, but Tom, it doesn't have anything to do with the Word of God here, and it's not this, and it's not supporting the truth, and so on. Uh, folks, what we've been talking about and where we're going with this is a really important issue, and that is, what's the truth? W- what are you concerned about? Is it the Word of God, or mm-hmm. is it your own ideas, or is it something that makes you feel good, mm-hmm. and so on? Hey, the Word of God, there's nothing that can make you feel more joyful and excited. On the other hand, if it brings conviction of sin, you don't want to go there. Yes. And I won't say you, but, but people do not want to go there. That's mm-hmm. not popular. That doesn't work. But it will, what does it say in, um, in um, I'm trying to think of the verse, uh, First John, or not First John, but John 8. Uh, if you have his word, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Mm-hmm. You know, so the, it's the truth of God's word. So the battle is... The truth of God's word versus the subjective feelings of people, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and if it comes down to what makes you feel better, well, it's the truth that sets you free. It's not, it's not what you've made up or conjured up. It's like that's there's pleasure in sin for a season, and that may work its way, you know, in a short distance. But bottom line, if it's not the truth, it's antichrist, yeah. and it's going to have that effect. Yeah. Um, so one of the things that um, <clears throat> and then I started to mention uh, that these friends of mine who have, because we talk about psychology, when we're talking about psychology, only a small part of psychology, a very small part is scientific. All the rest is subjective. That's why it's called physical, or not physical, but it's called, um, it's a therapy. Yeah. But it's a subjective mm. therapy that's just based on feelings and emotions. That's that's what it's all about, and again, there's no basis in truth to that. So, and and if you're concerned about that, and somebody's promoting this idea, whether it be uh, you know, a psychology, uh, a therapy uh, that seems right, yeah. hey, chapter and verse. Yeah. If it's right, it's going to be in God's word. It's going to be in the scriptures, and it will produce. I mean, it may be a struggle, it may be a battle, but God will be involved in it because it's his word that you're hanging in there for right. the word of god will set you free because and you say well wait a minute but but it doesn't have any scientific basis guess what psychotherapy mm-hmm. does not have one jit one uh one iota okay mm-hmm. of truth mm-hmm. none zero and if you say well it does fine give me chapter and verse or show me from the from the scriptures, why this is true, but you see again the battle is God's truth, God's objective truth, through the feelings, the objective ideas, or not, the, or the subjective ideas of men, mm-hmm. and that's where it's going. And all the things that we've been talking about, 
that are out there. And, and folks, you see it. You, you, you can see how overt it is to the point where yeah. how could anybody believe this? Yeah. And what, what, what is this? Let's talk about the whole transgender move. Yeah. It has no basis other than what people think it's going to make them feel better. And then if you're against it, then you're, you're homophobic or, or you're this or that. You know, so they've got to have these terms that, that they throw out there. But again, it's just a dodge from the truth because mm-hmm. it doesn't work. Right. It right. can't work because it's based on the lies of the adversary. I remember when I was a young believer, I'd have the radio on, and, and the, the Dobson focus on the family would come on. And it dawned on me one day after several months of listening that they're really observing the flesh. And people people say, oh, yeah, I, I feel that way about my mate, or I feel that way about my kids, or I feel that way about my life. That's what it directed people to do. And they observe the flesh, but then you have to have an answer in accordance with the flesh. And that's when I turned that show off, and I went, wow, the Lord showed me that. And, and the Bible observes yeah. the flesh. It tells you exactly what your flesh is, that, that there's nothing good about it. And I think people don't want to hear that. They'd rather, you know, have, like you said, ears tickled. And, and I'm thinking about, while you're talking, I'm thinking about a verse about the simplicity that is in Christ. It's not complicated, right, Tom? Because you make it sound simple. And it says in 2 Corinthians 1, uh, uh, I'm sorry, 11, 3, but I fear lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Everything else, Thomas, that we've been talking about all this time is complicated. Mormonism is complicated. JW's is complicated. But the gospel and just turning to God's word is so simple. How can we get people to just simplify, simplify? See, and that's that's one of his and one of the adversaries' programs. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of a definition, one definition of mysticism, for example, is confusion. Mm. Now, look, it shouldn't be confusing. Well, first of all, what you just mentioned, Mary, is that um, God would really uh, have a bias against those who are brilliant and bright and so on. I worked with the smartest guy I've ever known. I'm not saying there weren't anybody smarter, but but in terms of my own experience, and that was Dave Hunt. The guy was absolutely brilliant. But if that's what it took for me to be loved of the Lord or me to, uh, you know, have something that, that would be effective in my life, if it took brilliance, hey, I have to take myself out of the picture. You know, that's, <laughs> that's, that's not me. But it's not. And God would not be fair if that was the criteria for, you know, for um, pleasing him and so on. Yeah. No. Look, who was... <laughs> well... You know, one of to me an enigma in 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 the scriptures. You know, I I believe he's a believer because he wrote Ecclesiastes. I'm talking about Solomon. Wasn't he? He asked for wisdom, yeah. and God gave him wisdom. He had more wisdom than anybody, you know, or any man outside of obviously Jesus, the God man. But what? The, but wait a minute. How did he go astray? Well, he had wisdom, but he wasn't obedient. To the mm-hmm. wisdom, to what was what was said. So that's why, look at all the sins that he did, all the mm-hmm. women that he married, and all of the issues that he, he went south, biblically. Yeah. So the point being is that it's not a matter of brilliance. It's a matter of obedience and submission yeah. to the Lord. Yeah. And the only way that, well, I can't say it's the only way, because Satan has, you know, we're not to be, we're not to be in the dark about his, you know, all the things that he has, and he puts out his devices, as the Scriptures talks about. Mm-hmm. Okay, if that being the case, then I'm not going to follow something that doesn't have a basis in the Scriptures, right. that, that I can't support by chapter and verse. Mm-hmm. And that's, it's a battle, folks. So look what, you know, you, I, mean, I can quote the Scriptures here, and I think I did earlier. The time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. Mm-hmm. So that's a battle for believers. It's not that they won't ever, or there's not going to be a remnant, but nevertheless, right. we've got to submit to him. And no matter what the consequences are, conviction of sin, repentance, all these things are in place by the by our Lord to make our lives effective to his yeah. glory, first and foremost, yeah. and then to the edification of others who we interact with, whether we're parents you know, whatever the situation might be. Right, redeeming the time, because the days are evil and very perilous times. 
Uh, Tom, we were talking about media um, earlier, and I think that talk about appealing to emotions. I, I go back to what I'm thinking of the shack, how it how it just became such a phenomenal bestseller, then it became a movie. And I read it, and I thought, well, the, people say, well, it's nonfiction. No, it's fiction. Well, it's a strange, oddball mix that only the church could come up with in the last days where you take a real living being who has revealed himself in God's word without question, this is who I am that I am. And now people are messing with that. And I thought, that's incredibly um, irreverent, uh, no fear of God whatsoever. Well, you know, if that wasn't bad enough, uh, we get the chosen where people see these images on the screen and they say, well, now that's a Jesus I can relate to. That's a Mary or a, Paul, uh, uh, a Peter that I can relate to. I, I, I like that version. And so now people are so uh, enamored of it. Either you love it or you hate it. But Tom, you were telling me about this uh, a Christmas present, and I use that very tongue-in-cheek. Oh, that came out. Go ahead. Just because you, you, you brought this to mind, let me okay. go back to the, uh, I mentioned the Bob Gans. As Yes. If you don't know Deidre Bogan, they have probably written more about the issues with regard to psychology, psychiatry, mm -hmm. all of these things, as opposed to the Word of God and so on. So they've been, you know, just a long time. Uh, so I've been so blessed by them. And as I was talking to Martin, remember, their background is psychology. Mm -hmm. So we started talking about um, the emotions and how these things were taken over. And so Martin said to me, to Tom, you don't have any problem with that because that's what you know. In other words, what he was pointing out was I, you know, I was a screenwriter in Hollywood. I used the, the media. Uh, and, and, and in using the media, what did I try and do? I tried to control the emotions of the audience. And if I didn't keep that in control, I needed to make them laugh, cry, mm -hmm. uh, you know, titillate them, whatever it might be. That was my job. And if I didn't do that, guess what? I lost my audience. Mm. And if I lost my audience, guess what? No box office. That's right. And no box office, <laughs> Tom, you're out on the street. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. <laughs> Not going to work. But the point was that that was the power of the medium. And the power of the medium now is being used by the adversary uh, and used by the church, as we will talk about, you know, a little later. Mm -hmm. Because they think through this, you know, whether it be the shack, whether it be the chosen, whether it be uh, journey to Bethlehem, um, all of these things. Or let's go back to Noah. Let's go back when Hollywood decides they're going to translate the Bible visually, guess what? Mm -hmm. You're, you're going to get a lie from the get-go, from mm -hmm. the first frame uh, of whatever they're presenting. Because, number one, you can't replicate the truth of Scripture because it's not set up to do that. Yeah. You know, or you can say, well, it's too bad, you know, way back when, you know, a couple of hundred years ago, a thousand years ago, they didn't have movies. They didn't have motion pictures. So, boy, did uh, was the Holy Spirit out of out of luck on that one? No, <laughs> it's a medium yeah. that does not fit right. the truth of God's word. Right. Well, no well put. Yeah. Well. So, put. so once you put something out there, uh, all right. <laughs> Wait a minute. Uh, since you got me on this one, uh, I will tell you this. Um, it is a story. I'm just making this up. Remember, I'm a former screenwriter. Okay. So I come home, and, uh, you know, I'm in the bedroom, and all of a sudden my wallet falls out of my pocket, and it just falls on the floor. Oh, peg, peg of my heart. I'm 56 years, by the way. <laughs> Thank mm. you, Jesus, for paying. Awesome. Um, <clears throat> but, but anyway, so the, the, my, so the wallet falls out, and it opens up to where I have some photographs in there. So Peg goes over, and she picks it up, and she looks at it, and then she looks at me, and she says, Tom, what's this? Uh, well, Peg, um, that's, uh, I'm trying to think of uh, you know, the starlet or something like that. But it, it's a picture of a starlet, okay, uh, a, you know, a gorgeous lady. And she says, well, what's this? And I said, well, Peg, um, that's such and such. And she recognized the picture. And then she, she said, I know who it is. What is she doing in your wallet? And I'm thinking, and I'm thinking, and I'm thinking. Well, Peg, she's in there because she reminds me of you. <laughs> you want to guess how? Yeah, I made that story up. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. you want to see? But you get my point. Yeah. All of these images, whether it's Jesus, I mean, I've I've heard people who claim to know the Lord and love the Lord, and maybe they did. 
But nevertheless, it's the eyes of Jonathan Rumi yes. that I left with. Right. I can tell you this. When Dave and I went to see The Passion of the Christ, Mel Gibson's movie, Dave came running out of that theater. I'm serious. Literally running out of the theater, crying out to the Lord, take those images from my from my mind. Mm-hmm. You see, that's the other power of the medium. That whatever you see on the screen, you can't get rid of it. Mm-hmm. I mean, you may by you know, over time or you get old and have a short memory, whatever. But the point is, it's going to be there. Yeah. And that's one of the effective powers of the medium. Right. Now, are there any good movies? I'm not talking about any and all movies. Right. There are documentaries. There are all kinds of things. What I'm talking about is when you try to translate the Word of God to the screen. Right. Right. It's demonic. It is. <laughs> yeah. I'm telling you, folks. Well, and I, you know, I do want to, we only have about eight minutes left, Tom, and I want to talk about Journey to Bethlehem because it came out in November. It's a musical about the lives of Joseph and Mary, the birth of, of Jesus, um, it took six million to make. Uh, Seven million was the box office take worldwide, and six million in the U.S. So they just barely broke even. But I watched on on YouTube the half an hour that the Brian Call put out about this, and with various clips uh, and that sort of thing. And please tell us what. Just give us some idea of what's in this and why we need to run for our lives from Journey to Bethlehem, and hopefully it won't become some kind of classic every year. Well, and, and that, 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 that's, a, that's a good point, because movies that, you know, for example, Mel Gibson's um, Passion of the Christ, that's shown in, in, in pretty much, for the most part, solid churches mm-hmm. every Easter time, mm-hmm. okay? And what has it done? It's, it's the Catholic gospel of salvation, yeah. okay, right. <laughs> folks? And... Uh, if, for example, Mel Gibson was he was interviewed by Christianity Today, and he was surprised. He said, "You know, I was really surprised that you evangelicals, you know, really got into my very Marian movie, mm-hmm. Passion of the Christ, mm-hmm. was not about Jesus. It, it was a, you know, it right. was about Mary and her suffering through what Christ right. went through." Right. Okay, the point is, it comes around. They become classics. And this this movie, um, uh, you know, Journey to Bethlehem. It, it won't be a well. It'll only be a classic in the sense it probably, you know, won't get its money back. But the point is, is that it's going to be around. It was one of the best productions uh, that I've ever seen. Why do I say that? I'm not saying it was truth right. or that it was good, but I'm saying from a professional standpoint, and that was my background. Um, there's nothing. There's nothing that you wouldn't like about this. It has music. It has humor. It has all of this stuff. Uh, and it's supposed to be the story of Mary and Joseph, as Mary said. And what what were they doing? Well, they're they going to Bethlehem, and uh, the drama had to do with Herod wanting to kill you know, the baby Jesus because he didn't want another king to take over his spot, and so on and so forth. So uh, Pilate is—no, sorry, not Pilate. That, that's another problem <laughs> movie. Um, but Herod has a son. And he assigns his son to go find the baby Jesus and to kill him. Okay, now, actually, Pilate, I'm sorry, Herod, the, the name of the son is Antipater. And Antipater turns out to be the hero of the entire production. And again, it's Mary and Joseph and the birth of Jesus, the nativity, and so on. Slight problem here. Well, Tom, what's your problem with it? You just said it was a great production and in terms of quality and music and what's there wasn't, wasn't anything to like except hey it's a lie yeah. well tom how can you say it's a lie they're talking about mary and joseph and herod but who's auntie potter i challenge anybody and i'll, I'll you know <laughs> i'll make a bet with you i could but i you know i won't go there but what was the problem there is nobody in the bible named auntie potter <laughs> slight problem huh yeah yeah but the emotions of this thing, it's, it is overpowering, overwhelming. It's part of the adversary's seduction. You see, if he can't, he's, number one, he has no truth. All he has is emotions, feelings, and so on, some very subjective stuff. Mm-hmm. And if it's based on feelings, there's no apologetic for it. Right. Except, well, I don't agree with your feelings, but, but nevertheless, it's not a matter of agreement. It's a matter you can't, can't turn somebody away from their feelings if they don't have, as quoted in the, in the earlier part of the program, 
nightmare if they don't have a love for the truth. Yeah. Yeah. If they don't have a love for the truth, then anything goes, and the adversary uh, has an apologetic that, you, you know, it's not like it used to be. Mm-hmm. It used to be, give me chapter and verse. Mm-hmm. Now it doesn't matter about chapter and verse, because they will not endure sound doctrine. Right. They're listening to others, the people that tickle their ears, and so on and so well, forth. And the music is so powerful. About, the music is, will oh, sway the emotions in a heartbeat. The music's incredible. But, but the characters take a back seat. None of them are true to what we read about in the Scriptures. I mean, they, they completely rewrote... And then there's a scene with Mary and Joseph, ha- you know, having a little tune. He's juggling some fruit, and and it's it's just surreal and it's kind of weird, um, to say the least. And then Mary has sisters, and there's a musical number with Mary and her sisters. It, you know, if you expect to recognize anything about the nativity, you won't. But that's not. We don't want to miss, folks. We don't want you to miss the point here. Once you try to, you know, I, I've got a video at the Brian Call. It's called Visual Idolatry. Mm-hmm. Once you try to translate the Bible visually, you've left the Word of God. Yeah. It's not there. There's, no, there's not enough dialogue. I mean, if, even if you could do a reasonable production, and some people say, well, we're just using the Word of God and all this stuff. No, if you're translating it visually, you have stepped out of line. You have, you, you, you're into visual idolatry. And it's condemned by the word of God. Mm-hmm. Well, Tom, what do you mean it's condemned? Well, let's try. Uh, let's go for a verse here. Um, if we can, well, I, yeah, I I should know it. It's it's Proverbs chapter thirty. What does it say? We are not to thou shalt not add unto his words, mm-hmm. lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. We, we can't add anything to it. And if you're gonna put it on the screen, you've already done that. Mm-hmm. You, you you've just you're condemned by the Word of God as being a liar, mm-hmm. because they're lies. They're not the truth. And again, just to, just to underscore this, what do we have going on here? We have either the Word of God, which is the truth, the Word of God, which is the truth, or we have feelings, emotions, things that are put out there by the adversary. Mm-hmm. And I just read you the verse. Mm-hmm. We're not to add to his words lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. That's Proverbs 30, mm. verse 6. Wow. Yeah, that's powerful. And I keep thinking of um, Philippians 2.12, um, you know, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. And, and people don't like that verse. They go, we don't work out our salvation, you know, and they, they worry about legalism. But really what it is is having, um, you know, the reverence for God. The fear of God here is a reverence for God and also a fear of offending a holy God, and that the church has left this off. These media have left that off. They don't fear God. Uh, I re- also am thinking of Isaiah sixty six two. The one for whom I have regard is humble and contrite in spirit, and trembles at my word. That's pretty serious stuff. And and I think the church has completely uh, yeah. gone in the wrong direction. And they don't even know that verse is in there because they don't bring their Bibles to church. So well, we, let me give you another verse. This is. Um uh, now I'm a little, little okay. <clears throat> this has to do with Hebrews, uh, chapter two, verse one. We have one minute left, so we got to wrap it up. Okay. So, go Here for it, comes, it. Folks. go for it, Tom. It says, "Take heed to that which you have heard." Talking mm-hmm. about the truth, the word of mm-hmm. God, the objective truth. Take heed to that which you have heard, lest ye slip. Mm-hmm. You see where that's going? Yes. Once we add this or add that or something like that. You know, I mean, there's no slippage today. It's an avalanche. It's, yeah. it's overwhelming. Oh, yeah. It's just, uh, but, folks, a love for the truth. Get into the God's Word. We've got to flood ourselves. We don't need to slip. We need to flood ourselves with the Word of God, the truth, mm-hmm. because that's the only thing that will set us free from our delusions, Amen. set us free from the the works of the adversary. And to teach our children to be lovers of truth, too, so pass that along. Um, we've been talking to T.A. McMahon of the Brian Call today, and uh, what a blessing. Thank you, Tom. We appreciate your time, and hopefully we will be able to do this again sometime soon. Absolutely. All right. By the God, grace of God. Yep. God bless. God bless. Tomorrow, Pete Garcia on Stand Up for the Truth, and then Monday, Sean Patrick Terrio. That is a replay. We have Elisa Childers next week, uh, Dave Jenkins, Holly Pivik. So we have... Uh, A lot of of great meaty stuff next week. We hope you will join us um, for Stand Up for the Truth. We are listener supported. We so appreciate all of our donors and um, co-owners, I guess we can say that. We really, really appreciate you. So um, 
Friday, Friday's coming along with some uh, nasty weather. So hunker down and uh, my closing verse is, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. First Corinthians 15, 58. Have a great day.